because mm-hmm. it is the hundred year anniversary. Mm-hmm. And she was there on Black Wall Street in Tulsa. She was seven oh. years old, and it was a very historic Man. moment. Yeah, That's on CBS, crazy. and um, she talked about her experience. She was said she was seven years old. She's on Black Wall Street. They said, mm-hmm. "What do you have? You got shopping centers. You got movie theaters. You have Hospitals, restaurants. Yeah. You got banks. You got a, a vibrant neighborhood." She mm-hmm. was, you know, seven. Was just starting to be. Um, so, and not only that, what was very disturbing to me was she said it took seventy years for Tulsa to even acknowledge it. Hmm. Yeah. So. That's why it's like identifying Black Wall Street to me is like, man, what was this massacre that happened and why they destroyed? Who mm-hmm. are these people, you know, come in and raiding? What is Black Wall Street? Mm-hmm. Um, and that's, you know, lead me down to economics and then also understanding that if you go to Raleigh Durham in mm-hmm. North Carolina, mm-hmm. they'll speak of Black Wall Street being present there. Yeah. So it has to be more than just a piece of land at a certain place. It's more of a concept. Yeah. I'm Andre and this is the Speak Your Life podcast where we talk about everything as it relates to education, careers, values, mentors, and anything to do with purpose. We do this one impactful conversation at a time, whether a solo dolo with yours truly or our amazing guest to share stories, industry insights, encouraging words, and calls to action that can help you get closer to your why. Become a part of the Speak Your Life community by subscribing today to the podcast and following us on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram at Speak Your L-Y-F-E because life without your why is meaningless. All right, welcome everybody to the Speak Your Life podcast. My name is Andre. I'm your host. Be sure to subscribe to the podcast to get all the lovely content that we have on this channel. I don't know what just happened with my... Uh, <laughs> my mic here. <laughs> All right. <laughs> See, this is what happens with technology, y'all. Like, you know, you you accidentally roll your chair back the wrong way, it hits a cord, and all right, we're good now. We're good now. So, <laughs> anyways, be sure to subscribe to the podcast to get uh, this amazing content. We have uh, amazing guests every single episode, and we want you to be a part of the Speaker Life family. Uh, you can find us on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and be sure to follow the YouTube channel. We are growing it, we are growing it, and we are looking to get to a thousand subscribers by the end of the summer, and we want you to help us one subscriber at a time. All that being said, today's special guest is a Georgia Tech graduate with a computer science degree, served as technology analyst to a Bank of America Chief Technology Officer, co-authored the book entitled Plan B Sucks, and is the founder of the Black Wall Street Crypto Coin. Please welcome Amari Worthy. Welcome to the show, man. Thank you, thank you. Nice to have me. I'm glad to be here. This is this is awesome. It's dope. Yeah, Great yeah. Intro. Man, how are you feeling? Uh, one to ten. Yeah. I'm really a 10, really. I mean, I, I've been waking up excited lately, you know. Um, yeah, yeah. Yeah, what I have going on in the crypto space is accelerating, it's exciting, it's yeah. a lot of growth, so it's just, you know, keeping me moving, so that's cool. That's good, that's good. Everybody, you know, I, you know, sometimes people are, you know, feeling that. I, I, would, I would say everybody feeling, it's feeling at a different level. I'm not yeah. a 10 today, but I would say that I'm a probably a good six and a half. No. Uh, I was just like, I, I just came off of like a really long nap. Yeah. I was sitting in the car and I was like, man, I, I need to take this nap before the interview. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I know that heat out there drains you. Especially. Yeah, yeah. So mm-hmm. I'm just like working, you know, I started a new position at a, a big company and oh, so nice. I'm also just doing this as well. So, yeah. Oh, but uh, cool. it's been great just, you know, learning the new ropes and all that stuff. But anyways, we're not here to talk about me. We're here yeah. to talk about you. So Appreciate anyways, you ready to speak your life? I am ready to speak my life. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> all right, let's do it. So um, walk us through the, uh, like basically point A to point B, the day you were born to understanding why you were born. Yeah. And you can, if you want to give a day or year you can if not you can just give us the error or whatever you want to do yeah nah that's a good question um i was one of those kids i'm a millennial i was born in 1983 mm-hmm. and um i was one of those kids who were just naturally smart yeah so yeah. i made all a's in school mm-hmm. easily um yeah. so it led me to oh a lot of people in the family just saying you're the one you're smart and it you know led me down this education path as the way to get out, so to speak. Yeah. So that's what got me to Georgia Tech. Um, in seventh grade, I remember seeing Yahoo.com for the first time. And yes. I was like, wow, the internet. And it was just a basic gray screen with Yahoo.com. It didn't wow. have much on it. It was back during the dial-up days. And mm-hmm. I was like, I want to do that, whatever that is. And it took me to learn about computer engineering and computer science. 
mm-hmm. and took me to Georgia Tech. I still didn't really know what I wanted to do. I just thought that was a new cool thing. Yeah. Um, went through college still not knowing, and then I just kind of landed a job at Bank of America in Charlotte, North Carolina, and um, mm-hmm. another Georgia Tech grad just interviewed me for the position at Tech. And it wasn't a real interview. He was just like, yeah, I'm just kind of doing this in my spare time. You know, I work here as VP at Bank of America and um, we just, I want to do some interviews. And he said, yeah, I'm just gonna put you in. So that led me to go into Bank of America. And when I got there, sitting in my desk, Mm -hmm. um, making that salary, and I think I made like $60,000 a year. You know, it's not bad, come out of college. It's really, you know, a great salary, but after I took away my student loans, my apartment, Mm, my car and everything, I was left with $500 a month, (laughs) which was the same amount that I was left with at my college, you know, side job. So like I was making, you know, when you're living with your mom and all Mm -hmm. that stuff, I had 500 extra a month. And I'm like, yo, when I moved out on my own, I still only got 500 (laughs) a month. So that was the eye opener. Yeah. Um, And that led me to kind of start figuring out how do I get out of that space. Mm -hmm. And that's when I came across, the stock market like I got into real estate and when I saw those numbers light on that up on that screen it took me back to math it took me back to calculus it took mm, me back to mm. all the stuff I learned in school and I was like this is yeah. physics in motion wow and that's what phew, I've been going ever since yeah so that was a nice. late start for me I'm like I feel like I'm a late bloomer so it was like 22 23 when mm. I feel it really found my passion which was Wall Street Wow, yeah. wow. So I see you got the, 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 the drip here, you got yeah. the Black Wall Street hat, <laughs> the, the shirt. Yeah, the shirt, you know. <laughs> uh, never forget Black Wall Street. And yeah. and honestly, when I, when I because I was working at Bank of America, and I remember I'm in Charlotte, mm. and I'm um, moving in this leadership development program. Yeah. And I'm a young kid, 22 years old, and um, they had us meet with the senior leadership. Uh, okay. Ken Lewis, who was the CEO at that time, Bank of America. Mm. Um, a guy by the name Don Ober was the chief technology officer, and it was 14 of us. Yeah, um, yeah. And they normally in Bank of America didn't hire college grads hmm. and corporate leadership. So they decided to do something new, hire college people. It was kind of like a good old boys club. Hmm. And I was hmm. hearing the stories and we'll go to dinner um, with this guy. He explained his life and he'll say, sometimes I'm back there in the kitchen cooking salmon if I don't feel like waiting for the waiter to make it. And we're sitting there like, what? Okay. So the lady who recruited us for the program, she leaned over and said, yeah, he owns the restaurant. What? <laughs> so this is the kind of stuff, and he'll give a story about how he was advising for the president and stuff like that. So this is just my young self understanding the world, you know, mm-hmm. just coming from East Point um, in Atlanta, born and raised, and now just being open to what finance is. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. So that's what took that off. And that's I was like, let me figure out what Wall Street is yeah. and take this back to my community. Wow. Wow. So, yeah. um, man, it's funny that you mentioned that because I, I, I like had aspirations of being the wolf on Wall Street, the next yeah. wolf on Wall Street when I was like in college. And and then I took and I, I was an economics major for a couple of years and I did like double major with like finance and stuff like that. I was, you know, thinking I was big and bad until I took managerial finance. Yeah. <laughs> Boy, exactly. It was so bad. I had to drop the class, man. Yeah, I was yeah, like, yeah. ain't about to affect my GPA because I had three, I had a three nine at the time. I said, uh, uh-uh, uh, we ain't nah. about to do this. We about to drop this <laughs> class drop right now. <laughs> yeah, numbers can be super scary. I, I came yeah. back home to Charlotte, and I told my dad, and I was like, and I was doing the math because I'm trying to figure out how much money these guys make. You know, yeah. I, was, I was on the trading desk, and they was talking about these mortgage mortgage backed securities and how real mm-hmm. estate is never going back down. It's 2005, 2006. This is before the financial crisis, so I'm really mm-hmm. inside of seeing what's going on. Yeah, yeah. And I come back home, I tell my dad, I said, "Some, it's some bankers at Bank of America that make over 12 million dollars a year. So that means they make a million dollars a month. That, wow. You know, he's now. And I said, "What you'll do with that?" <laughs> I said, "You know what, son?" He said. If I get that first paycheck for a million dollars, I'd never come back. <laughs> that was just how much money. He couldn't even believe, believe the story. Like, he's like, yeah, yo, if they give funny. me one check for a million dollars, he's thinking that it's almost like stealing <laughs> or he shouldn't deserve it, that he's going to be like, I'm gone. Wow. And I'm like, because it was an hour. I'm like, yo, they make this much money, you know, mm-hmm. and it, it gets you because you're used to making $10 an hour, seven. I mean, minimum yeah. wage is $7. Hours, so you mm-hmm. honestly don't know how much money is out here. And yeah. that was my... and to can I obtain this and that yeah. that so that's Wall Street wow. and um, you know it leads you of course to trading understanding stocks and if mm-hmm. you don't have a lot of capital it back then even though you needed more now it's so easy to just open up a brokerage account and start trading stocks trading options and that's mm-hmm. fast forward so I started that journey in 2006 where it might have been a lot harder to get into 
mm -hmm. um, what they call stocks and bonds okay. and trading those. But now it's a lot easier. So the evolution of yeah. it was me back then trying to create classes, explain it to people, mm -hmm. understand the software, the charting yeah. software, um, how to download it, which was a long process, how to call into your broker. Wow. But now you can just fast forward to where you can download Robinhood and interact when it comes to Wall Street. Yeah, it seems like the landscape has changed as far as like, you know, investments and all that stuff. I remember brokers were so big back in the day. Yeah. But I, I just feel like, I hate to say this, but I feel like they're heading to be obsolete, honestly, because yeah. it seems like you don't need brokers nowadays uh, for the transactions that people make. And yeah. a lot of retail, you know, traders like myself are entering the markets, you know, starting with Robinhood and other apps like TD Ameritrade and stuff like that. So it's just like, yeah, the, 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 the I guess the concept of the original broker doesn't seem to be a viable option for the future. I don't know. What are your thoughts on that? Yeah, yeah. I mean, the broker uh, is is going away. You know, yeah. the broker is, is already kind of self-directed investing, you know, commissions free. Mm -hmm. Back on, on Wall Street, you used to have to call them on the phone and talk to a broker. Yeah. You had to pay $40 and they were the ones who had to put your order in. You couldn't even do it yourself. So That's that was true. the starting point to mm -hmm. the point where you wanted to call your broker and get advice first yeah. before you made the order. So if you wanted to buy a name, Fortune 5, kind of like Apple, you might call him and say, is it the right time? So it was almost mm -hmm. kind of like your advisory yeah. council. But now you have all the information on the internet. You can do the research yourself. You don't need the broker. If you had a broker, it's because you want some more information about a certain investment okay, okay yeah so yeah. i definitely think that's going away a lot of people are more knowledgeable you know the average consumer is a lot more educated now mm -hmm. um so yeah. which, which brings to okay identifying wall street more for the common person yes and then trying to put our understanding of what black wall street is and it's been around right so yeah, yeah. here in may is the 100 year anniversary that's so right in this us talking here just trying to understand what and identify black wall street I wanted to mm -hmm. start, I know um, this young, this not young lady, she's 107, but her name wow. is Viola Fletcher. She just testified to a House subcommittee a couple weeks ago because mm -hmm. it is the 100 year anniversary. Mm -hmm. And she was there on Black Wall Street in Tulsa. She was seven wow. years old and it was a very That's historic crazy. moment, yeah, on That's CBS. Crazy. And um, she talked about her experience. She was said she was seven years old. She's on Black Wall Street. They said, mm -hmm. what do you have? You got shopping centers, you got movie theaters, you have Hospitals, restaurants, yeah. you got banks, you got. A, a vibrant neighborhood she was mm. you know seven was just starting to be um so and not only that what was very disturbing to me was she said it took 70 years for Tulsa to even acknowledge it hmm yeah so that's why it's like identifying Black Wall Street to me is like man what was this massacre that happened and why they destroyed who mm. are these people you know come in and raiding what is Black Wall Street mm. um and that's you know lead me down to economics and then also understanding that if you go to Raleigh Durham in mm -hmm. North Carolina, mm -hmm. they'll speak of Black Wall Street being present there. Yeah. So it has to be more than just a piece of land at a certain place. It's more of a concept. And yeah, it's yeah. the mindset. Yeah. It's the, the mindset. And exactly. So you, you can't burn that down. You can't burn that down. So if you were to give like a quick history lesson in a couple of minutes for people who, because there's a lot, of, I would say. A lot of people didn't understand what Juneteenth was. Yeah. They didn't understand what Black Wall Street was up until, you know, 2020 during this, you know, yeah. a lot of the protests exactly. going on, George Floyd, stuff like that. And there are still people who, who may not understand it uh, as well out there. So if you could explain really quickly in a few minutes what basically Wall Black Wall Street was and, and what we're kind of... Acknowledging yeah. this hundred year anniversary. Yeah, yeah, because I, I I agree with that. Last year, and it, it kind of put another fire up under me because the whole rebuild Black Wall Street, understanding that the massacre happened, and understanding that the hundred year anniversary was here. Mm -hmm. You know what is, um, and even in Atlanta, there's like a lot of Black Wall Street markets kind of popping up. We're trying to speak on it, mm -hmm. um, and and what Black Wall Street is at its core is the bank. Mm -hmm. It is the banker, you know, it is the banker in the community. It's not, it's not the pastor, you know, mm -hmm. it's not your local, what they call him, quotes, the pharmaceutical guy that everybody's mm -hmm. aspiring to be, yeah, the drug dealer yeah. in your community. It's not the athlete, you mm -hmm. know, it's not the entertainer. Yeah. It's something that was in our community and was removed yes. and we're trying to reestablish and that's the banker. That's gotcha. the person that you go to who has the bank. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> And we we don't have black a lot of black banks in in America now. Black banks. I think last year it was twenty two. We mm -hmm. have Citizens Trust Bank here in Atlanta. Um, 
but we know banks to be what we call brick and mortar, the place that we take cash and go deposit into mm -hmm. and then they loan it out. Yeah. Um, that's what we know a traditional bank to do to be. So identifying Black Wall Street is to understand what a bank is in the black community. And it's yeah. the collection of cash, right, to give to somebody and deposit in a safe and they can use that to lend out to the community. And that's how you get your businesses is you have to lend out to the community or ex give credit, so to speak. Mm -hmm. um, and it's fast forward today where they got the stimulus checks and we understand stuff in grants form. So banks mm -hmm. can even give out grants now and stimulus yeah. checks. Um, the government and, and so to speak they were trying to figure that out but honestly banks first job was to extend credit and we got it at a high interest rate so mm, black yeah. wall street is a bank in your in, in your community at the core <clears throat> um so to expound on that i guess to get into wall street and what we talked about investing mm -hmm. the step before that is saving yes you know and that's what i think is the step so you you talk to somebody who we're talking about how to rebuild a community we're talking about getting people out of a poverty mindset mm -hmm. so now we're talking about identifying black wall street you go yes. to your banker to get out of poverty to get out of debt okay. you know we're talking about mental health issues and stuff like that but a mm -hmm. lot of constraint is debt you know yeah. um it's about how can i get out of debt how can i restructure my finances how can i have a, a viable stream of income coming mm -hmm. um and saving is is looked at is frowned upon because it didn't do anything yeah. You know, what, how do you save money? Yeah. Interest rate. And you save me cash. The only way you can say you take your cash and you put it in a bank and it's supposed to do something, but it doesn't, yeah. it diminishes in value, which is crazy, right? You're trying to yeah. save money and it doesn't grow. And and that's what sparks. So now Black Wall Street mm -hmm. is how can I take cash and grow? Yeah. Um, and we couldn't do that for a while. And after the 2008 crisis, um, mm -hmm. you know, savings went away. The savings rate went away. Yeah. So, you yeah. know, we're here to talk about the money. We're here to talk about the cash. How can we get it back to our black community? We keep on fighting for it. We understand it. We're seeing this thing happen. Can mm -hmm. we build communities? We had Auburn Avenue here in Atlanta before. Yeah. You know, these things. And we know this stuff was burned down, torn down. So we might be capable of this stuff if we can get our banking infrastructure correct. Yeah. Because, um, um, you know, like during that time, like uh, like for, for, for the people who may not know this, like, to give context, like back then, that you know, during the Black Wall Street time when it was in Greenwood, um, it was running. They said that the dollar ran between thirty-six to a hundred times uh, within the community before it left. Yeah. So, or or equate that to about a year before it left the community, um, and then bring it back to fast forward to now. They say that Asian communities um, it, it circulates about a month before it leaves. For Jewish communities, about 20 days. White communities, 17 days. And for black, the black community, it's a whopping six hours. Wow. That's just to give you context. That's just like when I was like reading about that, I was like, that's mind blowing to think. Yeah. We went from 36 between 36 days or 36 times to 100 times, um, or about a year to now only six hours of circulation before the dollar leaves our community. That's insane. Yeah. yeah. So. Yeah, and and that and that's due to the lack of bankers. Mm -hmm. And what I mean by that is we as black people are afraid to hold our own cash. Mm. You get what I'm saying? Wow. So that's, you know, if I'm talking about banking, I'm talking about bringing money back to our community. Let's talk about, we have to define certain things. Money okay. is a collection of coins and banknotes. Yes. Cash is just coins. Mm -hmm. Your cash is the physical paper, mm -hmm. the actual coins or something that's physical that you can swap and trade. Yes. But money is banknotes, meaning that as a bank, I can take the cash deposits and loan out a higher number than the reserves that are in my cash account. Mm -hmm. And that's the mm -hmm. digital money that floats around the economy that is attached to cash as well through credit, lending, and the fractional reserve system. Yeah. So in order to build a bank or become a banker, you have to empower yourself to go get your cash in some form. Yeah. So now if you think about our community, think about the black community, well who's comfortable carrying cash? The person we call the the drug dealer, so to speak, <laughs> right? You know, the that person, but your average nine to five person is gonna mm -hmm. keep their cash in the bank. Our banks, yeah. we bank with the white community. Why do you think we don't trust ourselves when it comes to holding money? I think there's been a lot of ways to get the money out of our pockets. I mean, be honest with you, they burned mm -hmm. down Black Wall Street. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? So it, that has lingering effects 100 years later, I think, for and us psychologists. Yeah. you think it's manifested? Like, in um, 
the take different ways of them taking the money out of our pockets through credit cards, through the yeah. whole, um, you put it here, we'll grow it for you, you know, kind mm -hmm. of selling us different financial products. Um, and then also just being afraid of being robbed, right? You know, just mm. if you have cash in the house and stuff yeah. like that. So, you know, it's kind of understandable. If you had a large amount of cash, it's hard to store it. Yes. So now when we start talking about cash and the principles of it, mm. when we talk about actual dollar bills, they're hard to store, they mildew, they do this for a reason. Like you mm. can't bury money, it'll mold. Yeah. You know, it's like how to store, how to keep it safe. and. Um, not only that, you know, money go out of circulation. You have to create new money. So yeah. that cycle in which they do deal with cash makes you kind of afraid to say, I don't even want to hold it. Let me let somebody else manage it for you. Even if it's called just managing inside of a safe or a vault. Wow. Yeah. So identifying Black Wall Street is to empower you yourself as a banker to say, okay, how can I take my cash back? Mm -hmm. And you know, with the invention of crypto, Mm, that's mm. the first step to do it because now I can yes. tell you you don't have to go and pull a, a million dollars worth of cash out the bank to try to be a banker mm -hmm. I'm not even, I'm saying that there's a certain thing is called a stable coin you yeah. know a USDC coin or a tether that's pegged to a dollar mm -hmm. you take your money <clears throat> and put it into a crypto stable coin yes. and put it in a digital wallet yeah. and now you securely safe it with your passcodes you are the only person that has access to your money yeah. and now you're a banker Wow. And that's the step of Black Wall Street is, hey, whoever's in power to now, because they're telling us this cash is going away. You know, they're saying, mm -hmm. hey, stable coins are coming. Um, cash is no longer needed. We're going to now have more digital money, so to speak. Yes. So now with this invention, we as a black community need to identify that this is our time to rebuild Black Wall Street. Okay. You know, if, if we're afraid to hold our cash, if we don't have the ability to create a whole vault or a whole brick and mortar to st store our money, we don't trust each other, we mm -hmm. can now trust ourselves with digital wallets and storing our digital cash. Yeah. Yeah. I, I was reading something about like what Coinbase, uh, it, they did some surveys about people's excitement or trust or uh, hope for cryptocurrency in the future. And it said that. Uh, for people who are most excited to learn about crypto, uh, actually, the uh, black or co black college educated people are the highest likely to want to learn about crypto. Yeah, at seventy five percent, and sure. and people who are even not college educated at seventy percent as a whole yeah. in the black community. So we are leading the charge as far as like excitement and wanting and, and that yearning to learn about crypto because I think for so long with different things like redlining and, and going to banks and being discriminated from loans and you know uh, how we were it just like we were we only make up three percent of yeah. mortgage applications yeah. yet are 25 percent of the rejections which is the highest out of any race mm -hmm. um you know with all those different factors you know it's led us to you know see crypto as the, like maybe a new wave or a new yeah. hope mm -hmm. you know that light at the end of the tunnel yeah. because at least it takes away from I have to physically go into this place and show my ID or show my black face exactly. to a banker who may not like the yeah. way that I look. <laughs> exactly. They may not like my name or the yeah. way it's spelled. Right. So, and, and, and you know, for that reason, people can, you know, I can trade from wallet to wallet and I can set up an account with Coinbase or whoever, Trust Wallet, whoever. I'm, I'm giving them plugs. But uh, yeah. anyways, <laughs> you, can, <laughs> you can set up wallets without having to you know letting identity be a i guess a detractor exactly. for you to be able to invest mm -hmm. and so that's that's the great thing about that and, and i love how uh you know a lot of people are just getting excited about it and just uh just really learning right now just getting in because i feel like this is yeah. the early stages it's, like, it's definitely the early stages yeah. because education is not fully widespread and yeah. that's how we know and, and even you know we look at crypto and i know everybody say dogecoin dogecoin and they want to you know <laughs> get in that because they want to get rich it's elon's fault yeah <laughs> but i'm even saying hey this whole crypto um mm. renaissance so to speak yes. you, allows you to save too what i mean by that yep. is the starting point for anyone trying mm. to get out of poverty is identifying your own personal vault, your yes. own personal safe, your own personal piggy bank, your own personal mattress or sock drawer <laughs> where you save money. Like you don't yeah, tell anybody yeah. else, you finally earned you some money mm. and I want to put this away for later, you yeah. know? And <laughs> that 
is empowering when you can get your own digital wallet. And not mm -hmm. only that, you put in your stable coin. And I say stable coin because I'm not even trying to advocate any investments at this point. I'm just saying basic savings to say, mm -hmm. you can put your, your coins that are tied to the dollar and mm -hmm. save them the same way you were saving in JP Morgan or Bank of America. And then in this wallet, you can actually earn a higher interest rate. You know, the okay. USDC coin offers you 8% interest on your on your stable coin. So there's a lot of protocols for you to save and yeah. it's only for it's for you. Yeah. You can keep it for years, you can pass it on to your kids and no one else will know except you and your family. And that type of banking I think is the starting point to build mm -hmm. off of. So it's like when I say identify Black Wall Street, yes. it's the identifying the ability to have a digital wallet with digital money in it. As a, you know, to be able to store your to store your money. I was gonna ask you, is there, um, are, are, is USDC different from USDT? Is that like a yeah? Like great question. So yeah, so okay. um, when we're talking about like identifying Black Wall Street, mm -hmm. we're talking about identifying cash again. Okay. So when you say um, the, the the one of the things that we're hearing is cash is going away. Yeah. So now when you say USDC, we talk about these stable coins. Mm -hmm. USDC is a privately issued stable coin is pegged to the dollar okay. um, that's in a partnership with Coinbase. Tether USDC, USDT, mm -hmm. or it could be somebody else, but what they do is each different stable coin company can automatically do the swap. So what it does mm -hmm. is for each physical dollar, it gives you a digital representation of it. Yeah. Um, yeah. So what do I mean by that? Because right now you can have a debit card and assume that there's money on. I say assume, but I want to talk about what a bank is. A bank is a uh, um, financial institution that takes in public deposits mm -hmm. and create yep. a demand deposit okay. while simultaneously issuing loans. Yep. So what do I mean by that? When you give $100 to the bank, okay. they then put $100 worth of credit in your checking account and mm -hmm. take that real $100 bill and go put it in a vault and then able to loan on top of it. So it's a whole business. Yeah. What I mean by that is your dollar or every dollar you put inside a bank turns into a fraction of a dollar for okay. their balance sheet. You know, it's a whole dollar when it's in your hand and it's a yeah. fraction of a dollar when it's in their banking system because they're now able to use your money and earn compound interest. You don't get that percentage back. No. When you put your money and transfer it to these digital stable coins and holding your own digital wallet, that interest from that banking mechanism now comes back to you. Wow. Um, so now, you know, different, and they call them these stable coin issuers banks now because that's what they're doing right there, holding your money for you and, and swapping it out. Mm -hmm. um, that's the difference between USDC and USDT. Okay. Um, there's no difference in actual value, mm -hmm. but it might be just some difference in the technology behind it, who own it. In the operation. Okay. Yeah. That makes sense. Yeah. And, and so, like, where do you see, like, traditional banks heading, you know, because, I mean, in my opinion, I just don't see savings accounts sticking around with there you go everything with you know uh, the crypto space yeah. growing and, yeah. and and especially the cryptos the what we call the altcoins or any coin that's outside of bitcoin we call those the altcoins um like the ethereums the xrps the um uh you know i don't know adas like you can name them you know safe moon there's so many out there but um what are your thoughts on like this, the future of the banking system traditionally. Yeah. So get, get into un, uh, back to the what identifying Black Wall Street. Let's talk about the term bank. Yes. What is a bank right now? It evolved. A bank was a place when you had the gold coins. They were too heavy to carry around, so you needed a place in the city for everybody to keep their gold coins safe. Mm -hmm. And they issued you a piece of paper and said, "Hey, you now are you own fifty pieces of gold and said vault." And then it evolved to the bank now that holds cash in it. So you go to the bank if you want to withdraw, you know, a thousand dollars, they give it to you and actually paper note. So that's mm -hmm. what a bank is. Tradition is a vault. It's how to custody your actual paper, your actual coins that were physical in nature. Okay. So now banks have evolved where stuff is digital. You mm -hmm. get what I'm saying? So it's mm -hmm. no vault. So that the custody question comes into play because the savings account was you know your application on your phone mm -hmm. but the thought process is can you recreate the actual vault to which a bank is wow and that's what a digital wallet is is a bank you know what i'm saying yeah. it's like where do i store my money so if you store your money in a shoebox 
Nobody can yeah. tell you differently. That's not a bank. Yeah. You get what I'm saying? So now it's like, okay, some people might not feel comfortable with the piggy bank, quote unquote, mm-hmm. being your bank or the or the shoebox. They say you can't do nothing with money in the shoebox. You have to put it in like in a checking account or a savings account because they are thinking you have access to more products. It's in the system. You can send it better. Mm-hmm. So now what we're saying is the properties of a digital wallet yeah. is the same of a bank. You can send money from your digital wallet. You can interact with different protocols. You can do all these things. So now mm-hmm. it takes it kind of strips away that whole brick and mortar bank that you had to walk into, sit down, show your ID to where it's like, man, I can just download a digital wallet on my phone and that's my bank now. Wow. Yeah, so that's the, that's the new definition of a bank. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's why I'm, you know, hey, what's Black Wall Street? If a black person downloads a digital wallet, he's now a banker. He's now mm-hmm. banking for himself the same way the invention of YouTube allows mm-hmm. you to create your own cable show or create your own network or your own TV or, or yeah. Twitter allows you to become your own reporter. You That's know, right. crypto <laughs> and digital <laughs> wallet. Real news or exactly. fake news. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so, you know, downloading your digital wallet, yeah. you know, and I tell you, be your own bank. Yeah. You know, I say be your own bank. Awesome, awesome. The BBC reports a U.S. workers' online study said that nearly 70% agree public speaking skills are critical for success at work. Maybe you are a student looking to become a prime candidate for that internship or might I say full-time position, or maybe you have already been in the job market for some time now and you just want to stand out amongst your coworkers looking to get that raise you feel like you've been passed up for for too long now. Go to speakyourlife.com slash private dash lessons. That's speakyourlyfe.com slash private dash lessons. Again, that's speakyourlyfe.com slash private dash lessons to become a better communicator tomorrow by signing up today. Yeah, so yeah, being your own bank is, is so important because it's really like the concept of taking ownership because a lot of times we, you know, like you said earlier, we don't trust our own people uh, yeah. for different things. Uh, we don't, we, we, we're more likely to trust a white doctor than a black doctor. We're more likely to trust uh, a black, uh, I'm sorry, a white bank or, or financial yeah. expert than a black uh, financial expert according to statistics. Um, so just bringing that ownership and, and, and creating that trust again uh, within our community is so yeah. important. And, and, and you've done something where you're trying to bring that trust back and bring ownership back uh, in your own coin that you yeah. create called Black Wall Street. So right. can you tell us more about your own cryptocurrency that you created? Yeah, so my thought process um, behind Black Wall Street coin um, and, and understand this thought process of um, cash and money, meaning they're two different things. I want to say cash is what we call the actual coin, so to speak, like gold coins, and now it's kind of like what we call dollars, but you know, mm. just to call it coins. Yeah. And then we want to separate from money, which is banknotes, because inside a bank, um, they have treasury bills, you know, they have uh, mortgage backed securities, they have deeds. There's a lot of different things that can be used as money, stocks. Yeah bonds you know so money comes in different flavors yeah but the um the what they call cold hard cash is the actual dollar so mm-hmm. um translating that to what we call coins and crypto yes. so you're talking about bitcoin and now what these cryptos allow you to do is to swap tokens digitally as a way how we exchange cash in the real world so mm. um if you send money through traditional bank to London, it might mm. cost some fees. Yeah. So there's some friction on the money, meaning it takes money to send money, it takes money to make money, and okay. money can make money. But at the base level with the actual physical dollar, a mm. dollar is always a dollar. Does mm. that make sense? So that's the base layer of money, and that's kind of like what crypto coins are. So mm. the evolve from that, um, the Ethereum, um, blockchain, which is the second biggest uh, coin, which is is my favorite. Yeah. What Ethereum does, mine too. yeah, it allows you to um, be your own bank inside of a bank. Yeah. So the Ethereum network, um, which is uh, is ran on Ethereum coins or Ethereum or mm-hmm. the Ether, 
yeah. you also are able to create these ERC20 tokens or what they're called fungible tokens, mm-hmm. um, not the NFTs, and we can talk about that too. Yeah, Everybody's so tokens. excited about <laughs> NFT, and that's the non-fungible token. Yeah. But yeah. what I have is called a fungible token. Fungible token. Yeah, it's an FT, and it's called Black Wall Street coin. What's the difference? A fungible token is every coin is the same. So if I have a hundred thousand of them, each one represents the same. You know, it's the same thing. If you had ten of them, mm-hmm. and I took that ten and gave you another ten, you wouldn't know the difference of it. That's what fungible means. Non-fungible meaning. If it's a piece of artwork, each one is unique. Okay, um, so, it has their own price. Yeah. Okay. So now, when we're defining what this coin is in fund return, it's called a commodity. Yeah. That's like oranges. You go to the store, mm-hmm. you're not, you know, you're looking at the oranges, but it's a bunch of oranges. You're not mad. That you just want 10 oranges. You can mm-hmm. swap it out. And that's what fungible means in nature. So gotcha. um, cash is like that. Like if you gave me a $10 bill, I can give you 10 ones. I can give you two fives. That means it's fungible. It's still worth the same value. Mm-hmm. Whereas each NFT is different. So with my Black Wall Street token, each one is the same. So I'm recreating coins in the Ethereum uh, ecosphere, and that's Black Wall Street. Yeah. Um, the thought is money is going to become more social. You okay. see, had a great thing. What's the difference between USDC and USDT? Mm-hmm. There's there's no difference to the person who just cares about carrying cash around. If you just want to say, hey, I need ten dollars in my wallet. Mm-hmm. You don't care if it's USDC or USDT. Um, only at a social level, right? You're attaching to the brand. Hey, mm-hmm. I like this brand, I like that brand. This wallet might give me more incentives for holding their cash and that's what a bank does. Yeah. You know, They try to incentivize you. So that's the same thing that's gonna kind of go along with the bank and the actual coin okay. being, the coin being the new mechanism of cash. Um, so that's why I created it was, hey, um, and a lot of people, you can do this on the Ethereum network, um, and they just call them social experiments, right? So once you mm. take it and peg it to a value and let it float, then that's essentially you're creating money, so to speak. Hmm. Um, so um, there's a, a, a coin out there called Ample Forth, you know, and it's oh, programmable wow. money. Ample you, yeah, Ample Forth. You have uh, DAI, which is programmable money. So you have like um, the USDC coin, which is kind of like a a mint and burn so if you give them a dollar they give you a usdc coin but also you have something like uh die which doesn't have any protocol behind it's just programmatic um Mm. keeping the value of a dollar wow yeah so my coin um is more of a savings tool um Mm -hmm. kind of allowing it to grow in the value over time and always adding to it and um, my social thing is to start a free lunch money program uh, for Black Wall Street. So going back into the schools, learning about financial literacy and uh, the young kids, let's say in middle school or elementary school, teaching them how to set up digital wallets and then mm-hmm. giving them some of the token that's just a first thought to h- holding your own money. Mm-hmm. Um, so it's like, you know, if you have five dollars and just kind of seeing it grow um, over yeah. time or you can spend it. So just the initial thoughts of what saving is. Well, yeah, that's pretty pretty important. And, you know, financial literacy is very, very, very important. And um, and I remember, I think we had talked last time you were here about Hill Harper and how he was creating a Black Wall Street wallet. Yeah. You've created a coin, he's yeah. created a wallet. Yeah. So may, maybe y'all can work together. I someday. know, right? <laughs> That'll be cool. I yeah. mean, um, we're still in May right now. Yeah, um, yeah. If, if this come out, he was anticipated to launch it, I mean, in June. So that June be, yeah. yeah, exciting. Um, Exciting for Juneteenth is the hundredth year anniversary of Black Wall Street, so mm-hmm. more than likely he's probably launching in connection with that. Mm-hmm. And he, you know, I saw an article on CNBC when he described why he was putting the Black Wall Street wallet out, and that's understanding what we call the black dollar. You know, we talk about Killer Mike and his uh, Greenwood, which yes, is um, the bank, yeah. yeah, and it's talking about oh, yeah. you know that's giving homage to Black Wall Street because Greenwood was a bank that mm-hmm. was on Black Wall Street and understanding how do we keep the black dollar um, in the black community. Yeah. So um, we were never able, we, we, we were able to do it and then we're constantly trying to continue to do it. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's the step of it is the Black Wall Street wallet um, is okay, we have a wallet, we can now understand the um, how our money is moving. You wow. know, and then we can say, okay, it's in our community because if all the, um, if black people all, are on the same wallet we own that wallet then we're now circulating money in our own community that is very um, true that's that, a very yeah. very smart way to do things and it's just like i guess the bigger question is how do you get well i you know you can never say everybody but how can you get a lot of us or even most of us to be on a wallet what's 
like what are some incentives or are there yeah. are there any that we know of right now or yeah i mean it's a lot of incentives i think they're kind of coming back mm. meaning um there's competition now okay. in the banking space um because of all the new technology so what does that mean now if you were to create your own coin yeah um you know you hear about airdrops so yes. you know uniswap was a big proponent if you interact with um their you know protocol they airdrop you some free coins hmm. um and that's the same thing you know with black wall street if i you know see people holding the coin and something i can airdrop it into that and that's incentivizing them to kind of want to do other things yeah. um what the space allows for mm. and what i'm doing my coin is 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 on uniswap it's pegged to a liquidity pool on uniswap so what does that mean it's always able to keep a value mm. so mm. you know um you can always go out there and see how much my black wall street coin is worth mm -hmm. which is kind of cool right so now we have this coin space where everybody trying to find the coin to get rich that's the reason why they indulge coin oh i want to get it go to the moon mm -hmm. um but on the other side of it for us black people in the community is it's a it's a lot of different parts of the bank and being a banker and the, um one mm -hmm. part is you know kind of like investing when we talk about buying the coins yeah and what's going to be unique and roll out on the other side is you know your own liquidity pool so like you're talking about with my coin mm -hmm. is i can now you know kind of create my own narrative you know with my yeah. coin and my liquidity pool and i can now um you know share funds with other people and we can kind of like do banking so to speak so mm -hmm. um let's say some advantages of having a coin is because it holds a price mm -hmm. if i was the one if i had a company i want to pay my employees that's one thing i can do with my coin right i can i can track the flow of funds if i want to invest in the community mm -hmm. i can then you know invest in the community with that coin i can see yep. where it goes if i want to invest in tech startups and stuff like that so yep. those are some cool applications of kind of like you know being a banker so to speak um that you can do um in crypto okay and just like on a side note what are your what are your personal thoughts on doge because i know everybody has has different thoughts on yeah doge. I, I mean I, I i really can't predict the future as far as price um mm -hmm. technology wise i think doge is you know an exact replica of bitcoin right so it's mm -hmm. a fork of bitcoin it's just a different name yeah and one is looking at bitcoin as if it's a real thing and they're looking at doge as if it's a meme coin yeah and that could just be perspective right you mm -hmm. know um mm -hmm. they could be both the same thing and yeah. um you're just trying to differentiate them from brand name only yeah right? so um at the end of it i guess money is becoming more social kind of like how media was like we coined this term social media okay but you had media and then it broke down in a decentralized fashion and became more social yeah and i think that's the same thing about money is about to become more decentralized and become social meaning you're now looking at the brand of the money mm -hmm. so to speak um okay. when it depends on what you want to hold which is a different thing gotcha yeah. gotcha gotcha so, yeah i i really hope that they can you know turn this joke into something like of utility because i think that could be very powerful because i mean people were making pump and dump money you know short-term strategy money on doge i've done that myself but just like i think it could have a long-term run if it does you know if they get together and be like hey let's figure out a plan like a structure of how we can actually use this to help somebody you know yeah in the world so yeah yeah and i agree those are the questions that are opening up now is now you have these big um what they call monetary networks or monetary okay. systems yeah and now you're starting to think about as the average person monetary policy like how did this network pay out to its you know its um user so to speak so mm -hmm. you'll look at something like twitter where you're a sign on and you'll be a user or instagram or facebook and mm -hmm. you're actively spending all your time with this application but it's not paying you yeah you know yeah, that's um, true. but with <clears throat> these monetary networks when you spend time with them they actually mm -hmm. have incentives uh -huh. um in form of money and that's why they're so popular right so it's kind of mm -hmm. like um money companies so to speak you know these these these, these different blockchains so okay. i say it to say like yeah. <clears throat> you know they might look at doge as a meme but it's still very powerful when it comes to a payment network you know even mm -hmm. if they don't do anything else to it it's indestructible it's always going to maintain a price 
and that's always going to attract users to come in and try to play um, at least the volatility game. Like you can't really tell somebody not to trade something, right? If the mm-hmm. price is moving, whether it's you know the game stops or the AMC's, what yeah. they call the meme stop. The Reddit community. Yeah, you can't right. Yeah. You can't you can't convince somebody that their um, thesis on why they're buying an investment is not true. So, mm-hmm. I mean, I say that to say, yeah, like. The whole space is powerful in itself, you know, yeah. um, when it's put against traditional means of investments. That's true. Yeah. That's true. And so, you know, with that being said, um, like, there's, there's like, uh, you know, so much importance to financial literacy as a whole, um, especially in our community. And, you know, what you're doing is, is really good and is really, you know, could be groundbreaking uh, to help other people, like, you know, especially like kids in urban uh, school districts to, to like learn about liquidity, learn about like things like Bitcoin, learn about Ethereum, learn about all those different things that in normal, you know, at least when I was growing up in school, maybe you had the same experience. Like the only thing like you really learn about when it came to finance is like, all right, save, you know, 10% or, you know, put away 10%. Yeah. You know, you might have a retirement account when you get older, you know, you work and then that's pretty much it. Like, yeah. Maybe you heard something about the stock market, but it's really not like, I don't know. I feel like the financial literacy uh, is so important to, you know, when we, when we think about equity and, and, and equality and all those different terms, um, what, are your, what are your thoughts on um, the, the meaning of financial literacy comp- you know, and financial competency when it comes to uh, black people having more wealth and having more equity and things yeah um for me I, i'm i'm always trying to find the most simplest way to put things you know and mm-hmm. um one of the books i read was a book called the richest man in babylon yeah very good and, book. yeah so like one of the quotes from that in that book was a part of all i earn is mine to keep mm-hmm. um so what am i saying a part of all i earn is mine to keep we in the black community Mm-hmm. Um, we're built on a foundation of taking our money and the the the, re- the religion of our money is to tithe it. Like we know to tithe yeah. our ten percent to the church. Um, mm-hmm. We feel like that or helping other people. Yes. But for some reason, we don't want to save our money, and mm-hmm. that is at the core of what Black Wall Street is: is not investing, not trying to find risk. But crypto introduces new ways to save money. You know, Mm -hmm. because these blockchains are not going away. Yeah. Does that make sense? Like something that you know about to be around for 100 years. It's something that you can put your money in. Mm -hmm. And when they say a store value, meaning you can store your money here for 100 years. You got to think about that. Like where else can you put your money and store it? And it's going to stay there 100 years later. So Mm -hmm. that in itself is the kind of thing that I'm trying to, you know, give people to understand is, hey. Yeah. You had a piggy bank or you had a sock drawer, you had a shoe box or you had a yeah. mattress, you know what I'm saying? And some people kind of knowing how to do the savings accounts, but yeah. you know, the power of a digital wallet and owning these coins mm-hmm. over time is going to really pull a lot of our people out of poverty. Yeah. So, you know, just being able to save onto your coins and hold it on to them, especially, um, I, you know, and it, if nothing else, you know, I love Ethereum. That's a, a, a very favorite of mine. And then, yeah. you know, Bitcoin, even if you just do the top two, I think um, that will really, you know, push a lot of our community out of poverty. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So that yeah. that's my takeaway. That's my understanding. Like, hey, if you can understand this and just say, hey, I, I just watched this podcast. So I saw this guy. and He really drove me. You know, I couldn't get my finances straight, but I just decided to take it upon myself, download me a digital wallet. Mm-hmm. and just start collecting these crypto coins and yeah. you know over time you know for everybody who's been in it you know i consider myself a crypto native mm-hmm. um but from you know a black nerd standpoint like from yeah. an educated yeah. standpoint like hey <laughs> yeah this is real right here you know and just trying to spread that news yeah no no that's that's definitely important because um yeah so many so many of us you know are not really into the stock market yeah uh, or not into investing they just you know my like my grandma uh she she did real estate but she was old school had her money you know under the the mattress thousands of dollars under the mattress you know but uh you know you gotta you know 
whenever we talked about savings account earlier, you have to take into account the the whole reality of inflation. Like that's going to destroy your money. Yeah. You know, ten thousand dollars today is not going to be worth ten thousand dollars next year, and so the the uh, the rate of return in which you can receive from like just investing your money uh, or staking your money or whatever, um, whether it be a stable coin or an, or an unstable coin uh, or volatile coin, um, you're going to be able to go past inflation. You know, yeah. What your return is. Yeah, and th- and that's the whole thing is to just kind of reiterate and bring it back mm-hmm. is is the when we think about our money now, let's say we think of a Wells Fargo account. Mm-hmm. You, the cash and the actual Wells Fargo bank, you know, the bank makes money as a payment network yeah. and you holding your money in there. So you holding your cash in a in that Wells Fargo payment network, mm-hmm. they don't pay you back anything. But even when you hold your money in that digital wallet, what we're talking about, when you're part of the Ethereum network, you're part of the Bitcoin network, it pays you back. And that's mm-hmm. why the price goes up over time. And yeah. that's what we're trying to say. Hey, there's a disconnect to where the bank used to pay you to hold your money there. You know, yeah. and that used to be a safe place. It used you to know, be, it yeah. used to be a safe place, but let's wake up and realize that over the years mm-hmm. that that no longer is a safe place. Mm-hmm. And we have to go back and, you know, another good book of mine is Who Moved My Cheese? You know, Who Moved My Cheese? Who, who, who was that by? <laughs> I forgot the name of the author. Who okay. It's a, it's a, um, yeah. um, a really famous book. You know, it's okay. a very easy book called yeah. Who Moved My Cheese. I remember reading about, like, yeah. my dad made me read yeah. that as a kid. Like, it's a very simple, it is a very simple, like, straight to the point. Straight to the point. Like, like four mice, they were stuck here, in a room, um, and it's kind of like in a maze, and they used to always get cheese every day put in that that are part of the maze mm-hmm. and then after a while you know the cheese was placed in another part of the maze yep and at some point the mice have to realize that the cheese is no longer coming to that point you have to get up and go search that maze mm-hmm. <clears throat> for where the new location is and that's what's happening like yes. i'm saying cash is going away like right now people don't understand people don't even use cash that much don't even understand don't. right you know <laughs> you use your debit card you don't even touch it mm-hmm. so you may allow the bank to swap out your cash and still reap the benefits but at this moment because cash is going away then you can kind of take some of that power back Mm -hmm. and some of us may do that so yeah who moved your cheese spencer johnson is the uh, the author on that Um, so definitely check that out guys richest man in babylon trying Mm -hmm. to empower you to say a part of all you all i earn is my mind to keep and plan B. Yeah, and plan B and is Plan B sucks. Yeah. Same plan B I, yeah, sucks. I am, I am author. Um is on Amazon, <laughs> tell us, tell Amazon us and Kendall. Uh, I wrote right. a book ten years ago called Plan B Sucks, mm-hmm. Work on Your Dreams, Not Your Bosses. Mm-hmm. Um, and it was mm-hmm. my take on just diving into the different mantras you can tell yourself yes. um, when you're working on your dreams. So any um, passion, pursuit, you know, any dream that you want to pursue when it comes to entrepreneur, um, I laid out these steps to start off with chapter one is wake up excited talking about um Mm -hmm. every day you should wake up and want to do what you're doing um there's a chapter called flame on it talks about Mm -hmm. the moment when you just let go of every excuse and you just dive into it Mm -hmm. Um, and it ends with success and just talks about what success is at a basic level um where most people think success happened overnight but it's uh, after a long series of grinding it out grinding it out and then Mm -hmm at some point you look up and realize that success happened so yeah um it's a really good book it inspired a lot of people um it's self-published and yeah, mm-hmm. check that out as well so. yeah, yeah yeah definitely and so you know as we wrap things up um we like to talk to everybody about if life was if, if if life was a house and you saw life like a house this big house what would be one of your foundational structures like that the house that life stood on um, when you speak on that, you talking about like principles or beliefs? Or yeah, like, yeah, yeah. Like, what is your 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 life, or you know, what does your house stand on, so to speak? Um, or um, you know, some people, you know, so many different things. Some people, it's love, peace, integrity, you know, joy, happiness. Uh, yeah. You know, what are what are some maybe one or two things that yours stands on? Yeah, for me, um, life is about freedom. To mm-hmm. me. Um, and that's you know you'll see that in my book Plan B Sucks Work on Your Dreams Not Your Bosses mm-hmm. um, it comes from me from you know my ancestors trying to be free you know and yeah. that runs in my veins so one thing about me that my house is being built on is being able to be able to um, have an open mind open heart mm-hmm. um, financially free emotionally free um, learning how to be an authentic um, person you yeah. know um, and that's what it's built on it 
and and going in that path, you mm -hmm. know. So I, I I look at it as, you know, give me liberty or give me death. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So that's the foundation I'm built on, and I'm sure. always here to kind of like yeah, embark yeah. on that that battle. That yeah. Journey, so. That's right. That's right. And uh, last question is is called question of the day. Yeah. Cool. I, and and it's it's like imagine if uh, racism or discrimination never existed. Yeah. What period or what era would you want to live in if those things did not exist? I have to go back in time. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's funny, you know. I, I tell a lot, a lot of people. Um, mm -hmm. Kenny Burns here in Atlanta, he had a he has a great quote, the dream is real. He always tell people not, you know, that inspired me growing up. Mm. And I tell people that time travel is real. You know? Mm -hmm. Um and I say that to say like I truly believe in manifestation and looking and being able to travel forward to different places. Mm -hmm. Um so if I say I had to go back in time, I would go all the way back as far as I could. So if, mm -hmm. if that was a thought, I'm just like, where, where's the beginning? If there's a such place, let's go there, you mm -hmm. know, and then let's start there and see how it all started. So, or is there like an era of music or era of uh, culture that you really appreciated that you were like, oh man, like this was like a cool time or uh... you, know, I'm I'm so present. I'm so in the mm -hmm. now. You know, the now is where I stay. Mm -hmm. Just period. So. Um, I don't like old cars. Okay. You know, I don't like. Oh, I like what's happening right now. I'm yeah. really, really believing in the power now. So sure. whatever I'm in right now, I really do enjoy that. So mm -hmm. there's no place in the past that mm -hmm. I, I, I spend a lot of time on. So it's either the beginning or right now. Yeah, mm -hmm. and and a lot of my mind resides in the future. So if it was a future place, yeah. But I mean, I, I love the now. I love yeah. being present and trying to figure out. You know enjoying the moment yeah so probably living on mars will be your your yeah. area <laughs> there, you <go. laughs> there we go so anyways uh thank you again for being on the show uh thank you guys for listening and tuning in to this episode be sure to uh subscribe to this podcast on spotify apple Podcasts, wherever you listen to your podcast and check us out on youtube make sure you hit that subscribe button and uh, hit the like button so that the youtube algorithm will allow this message to get to other people as well and I want you to also stay connected uh, to Amari as well. Make sure you check out his book, uh, Plan B Sucks, which you can find on Amazon and uh, all uh, different platforms, um, uh, wherever you buy your books, eBay, wherever. Uh, but Amazon is a, is a great place to start. So um, and is there um, like a website that they can check out or, or Clubhouse? they can you know follow you at yeah no i mean um i created an uh, instagram account um black wall street banker okay um, where it's kind of more about me just posting pictures but um you know listening to this and i would say from here is a personal endeavor right you mm -hmm. know it's um banking is becoming more free more open mm -hmm. um, more decentralized and it's about empowering oneself so yeah. uh, hopefully this is the starting point for whoever's watching it to allow them to go on their own journey um, yeah. and become empowered so. awesome awesome well thank you again for uh your input and just like your your, your great thoughts uh to this conversation so anyways thank you guys love you guys and we'll see you in the next episode All peace right.